So to, uh, uh, to recap, um, uh, we've had a facility for crypto request and response uh, for a while, and uh, it wasn't uh, adopted uh, really by the community. And we're really focused on, you know, moving things that, you know, people are actually using. Um, and then envelope came around because a lot of people, you know, needed to solve some larger problems. And we realized that we, um, uh, uh, kind of re needed to rethink crypto request and response for that. So we wrote some docs about how that would work, uh, last year, um, I think uh, Wolf and I are very confident that it can do all of the you know different things that we desire here, but we need to be able to help you. We need to better understand the use cases, the specific things that you need now. Um, you know, give us a little bit of time to kind of future uh, proof things. Um, you know, uh, yeah, but in the meantime, we can help you. Uh, you know, get some basic use cases going. Like I think it'll be trivial for us to, you know, replicate at least the, you know, the ability to say, hey, sign this legacy Bitcoin message type of, of stuff. It's the more complex things where, for instance, Jade Wallet, you know, has an exfiltration signing request. So, you know, it contributes nonces. Um, Craig has a lot of experience with flaws in how uh, Ethereum sign in with Ethereum works. I'm not sure if we're going to be doing precisely that because that has a back channel um, that uses web, you know, web RTC. I don't know if anybody's trying to do that, but if we are, we want to know. Um, and then there are other things that people want to sign where we may need, well, likely we will need to um, uh, create some more UR tags. Uh, and specify some uh, binary values for things for efficiency. So, um, uh, so that's really the, the topic of this call. Understand the problem. Um, uh, you know, let's you know, we'll go back and give you you know some quick answers and some ways that you could deploy things without necessarily full libraries that can do all the different options. And and in the meantime, we can work on uh, things that you know offer. The whole suite of possibilities. Um, so yeah, we'll, I mean, our, our, our stack has basically been designed. Yeah, so uh, sorry, Christopher, didn't want to step on your <laughs> on your tail there. Um, uh, yeah, so I mean, our stack is obviously designed to work over you know QR codes of arbitrary size using animated QRs as well as over the internet. Our, you know, the basic formats that we're working with are binary, uh, even though when people look at UR, they see text. Um, and, you know, uh, what I'm primarily interested in is finding out what your pain points are so that we can make sure that our technology is, is addressing them. And so to, you know, kind of, and to, to so, and, and also, to, uh, once I understand um, what problems you're trying to solve, then I can make sure that the solutions we're offering are things that you really want to adopt and you see the value proposition in, um, and not just, for example, you know, roll something quick in JSON because it's there. Uh, uh, but, you know, I want to show a uh, deeper val value proposition. So I feel like I need to listen before I can talk uh, on that on that question. So that's my first goal here is to listen uh, and then, um, you know, to talk out together uh, how we can make what you're trying to do with things like requests, responses, sign in, things like that, um, that much more uh, uh, both technologically workable and and uh, future proof and all those things. Craig, why don't you um, start off with kind of what is your, um, you know, immediate use case and and um, how we might be able to help you address it? Sure. So I'll take a step step back and kind of just talk to how I see the um, the sort of landscape with regard to the use of animated QRs um, as I've sort of seen it evolve as well. So you know, I think that. Um, we kind of began with static QRs. And when I was building Sparrow, I think the Spectre wallet um, was doing it with a fairly simple scheme, which sort of had a, a variety of different parts that they were then breaking up and sort of having this P1 of two, P2 of two kind of, kind of thing. 
and it, it just seemed a little bit um, naive. Um, maybe that's a little harsh, but anyway, it didn't seem ideal to me. So I was an early adopter of the UR stand standard. Um, and, you know, when we were first building it, and I think that the, the first use, use case, everyone was using just bytes, which I know is not what Wolf wants us to do, but that's how it was being used at the start. Um, and then, of course, uh, I think the first major, you know, adoption by the, certainly the Bitcoin wallet community was the PSBT format, which I think still remains probably the the kind of dominant use case in, in Bitcoin wallets. Um, it is a request and response format of a sort because, of course, we're passing PSBTs back and forth and we're kind of filling them in as we go. So I think it does very well at that that that, that job. I don't think it needs to be changed in any way. Um, the, the PSBT format itself is a request and response built into it. Um, then I sort, of, I, I sort of started looking further afield as to you know, what are the other requirements? And obviously one of the key ones, particularly if you are a coordinator wallet is you are looking to import hardware wallets. And that was the reason that I, I, I worked on crypto account, um, which uses the crypto output. Um, and that's really the, uh, the idea is just, just to be able to import a wallet, um, you know, with, uh, with a minimum amount of user interaction, it kind of just gives you all the information so that the coordinator wallet can easily choose and just say, okay, I want that piece of information. It hasn't seen the most uptake. I'm not actually even completely sure whether anyone's using it, even though Sparrow does accept um, those QR codes. Most people seem to have, unfortunately, from my point of view, kind of defaulted to the cold card um uh sort of output format that it uses to share and just sends that 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 across and it does work there's there's no issue but it's it's obviously not really following the ur spec so you know i think that there's not really much that one can do do there it's you know it's whether people want to implement things is largely up to them um so that kind of covers i think the two major areas um the one that's that's really missing um is i think the sort of legacy message sign of sign signing and i say legacy because the 322 which is the tap tap route the kind of modern version really hasn't seen a lot of adop adoption yet so i expect that that will happen in time but it certainly isn't the case today however what is true today is lots of people want to sign uh, a sort of message using a SegWit address or a legacy address, and that is all handled by the legacy sign signing. So that's kind of this big area. You can do that currently with any USB connected wallet, certainly on Sparrow, you know, HWI, which is the sort of interop program that most people use, handles that particular use, use case. But when it comes to QR codes, we've just got this huge gap that that there isn't any way to do it um, or there hasn't been and in the last sort of I would say six to eight months there's definitely been more um, user demand for that and we've started to see again Spectre has come forward with I think a fairly basic protocol which allows you to sign using a single QR code with the obvious limitation is that if you're the data you're trying to sign is larger than a single QR code you won't be able to do it. So again, I'd rather than just follow that, I kind of felt, well, let's go back and see, or can we implement this um, with animated QRs? And that's really um, what I started talking to Chris about last year. And I can see that this, this kind of alternative Spectre approach is starting to get adopted, um, you know, in various hard, hardware wallet wallets. And I kind of feel that unless we bring this to the animated QR world, we might just end up with a much more difficult hill to climb in future. So um, that's kind of, I guess, my major reason for being here today. And though I completely, you know, having read the document that Chris put out, all those different points, I, I completely see the bigger picture here. Um, I do think that there is an immediate need for this legacy message signing, uh, which is a request and response. We obviously have a message and some kind of, uh, you know, information about the key we need to send out and then we need to get the sign signature back. So we got this request and response um, protocol going on. 
Um, and it just seemed that, you know, you guys had been working on some, 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 something. I haven't had the time to look deeply into it, but um, I know that it seems to be an ideal use case for this request and response, which uh, you have spent so much time, time on. So, yeah, I, I guess that that's just a, a brief kind of summary of the history of it and uh, what kind of motivates me to be here today. So, Craig, a, a quick question, clarification. Obvious, so, one of the, the tricks that the, um, uh, the legacy message signing, I mean, obviously, it's a single key. You're referencing it uh, by an address rather than by a um, uh, rather than by a, a public key or um, 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 or a path or any of those types of things. Um, how much compatibility do we need to have with that versus you know you know saying here is a fingerprint and a path and here is the 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 signature if the signature is compatible or do we have to do the kind of a the weird address thing that they uh, uh that that legacy does yeah i mean you know what we actually need is a derivation path a script type and uh the message that we want to sign those, those are like the key things and if we look at what HWI does, which is, you know, obviously trying to aggregate um, all of these different USB based hardware wallets, you know, those are the, the, the key things that it requires. Now they are, because this is, you know, message signing is a bit of a messy thing. Unfortunately, fortunately, there are two different approaches. When you get into the actual signature creation itself, Electrum Wallet went off and did one thing, and then Trezor did a different thing, which they standardized to some extent in VIP 137. So there are kind of two approaches. Um, I don't think it matters hugely, you know, which one we take here, or which one a particular hardware wallet takes. It probably, in my view, better to take the Trezor approach, because at least it is in a VIP. Um, but uh, as I say, I think the key thing is, you know, you can certainly encode that information into an a sort of address, but I would say that the the, the key things are a script type, uh, a derivation path, and the message you want to sign. Yeah, it sounds like you're referring to a subset of an output descriptor, essentially, not a fully general output descriptor, but something that would be, a, you know, an output descriptor would be a, a, a superset of, is that correct? Correct, yes, you could certainly put it that way, yeah. Okay, Ken, um, uh, what are your pain points, use cases, anything more than what Craig has already described or a perspective on some of those choices? Um, I mean, the only thing we're using it for right now is uh, there's a cold card ability to, to do a, a signing of an arbitrary message that's passed in. And for that, you get a path uh, and the, the message to sign. And we're also using it for the CASA health check where they uh, just want you to be able to prove that you can sign for, you know, the hardware wallet uh, to like reassure the users that their key is still, you know, safe. And so that again, is just essentially it's a line of text with a, you know, some random data. Uh, we just provide the signature back. They, they include the path uh, and we have a script type. We just have a, a simple function that does the signing and returns the response. And I, I mentioned this in the chat, but right now, that response is just uh, UR bytes. Okay. Could you? Um, could you? Uh, uh, it's, it's, I, honestly, it's my, the whole UR bytes thing, real quick, since I've got both Craig and Ken here, is is ultimately my fault because I didn't make it clear enough in the early specs that I never intended bytes to be used that way. Uh, that uh, you know, the whole idea is you know, use higher level C war structures and declare them. So, but uh, mea culpa in that and, regard. But and we, know, so um, I'm, I'm trying to clean up the mess I made here. You know. Yeah, and so like when we were working with the CASA team, they had already sort of defined this as what they were doing. And so we were like, okay, well, if we don't want to like have this take like another month of back and forth, we probably should just use this. Okay. If you have a, a URL to that spec, um, or if there is a spec, um, I'd appreciate it. I uh, I was looking for the, uh, I didn't know, I had forgotten about this, the, the health check, but I had looked at, um, tried to find cold cards and couldn't. Um, uh, yeah, I'll see if I can find part, that. But I, I think yeah, it's my just part, test vectors would be the most important thing to get. It is essentially something that if I um, quickly throw together an example of how our technology could be used in this regard, I want to make sure mm -hmm. it, it 
it does what it's designed to do. Yeah. So yeah, I think the, th the three things are just what Craig had said, though. It's like the message, the path, the derivation path, and the script type. That's all we have. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, the I know you know one of the key things that that I really want to try to solve here is that you know Shannon and I worked really hard for a no sing you know no no single point of failure scenario for uh, a two of three which we wrote up in um, that smart uh, custody multi sig use case and explained how it all worked. Um, but you know like a lot of our other smart custody cases. It's just, you know, too many little niggling details. And so, you know, one of my big goals is that, you know, we can eliminate some of those niggling details um, that, you know, so, uh, you know, right now, all of our examples of PSBT kind of have a, uh, you know, an implicit trust because, You've got the wallet in your hand. You got your phone in your hand, and they must both be yours. <laughs> and I'm not sure that's you know always true. Um, but then there's like these multi-step things where I need to first get the you know get a public key, and then I have to you know the, if I'm a coordinator, you know I don't need to trust these wallets. I don't even need to have a private key. So that that whole mess could be made a lot easier if we can. Um, you know, do all of these uh, through some kind of crypto request mechanism. And then, you know, the joy might be for both Ken and for um, uh, uh, Craig is that, you know, instead of having this list of 50 different wallets and how every wallet does it different and what is the UI steps you have to go through to do it, you just tell it, here's the things I want you to do. And it comes back and says, I can do it or I can't. <laughs> uh, um uh, Ian, uh, Nicholas, or Sean, do you have any uh, particular things that we've missed here? No, I, I'm just I'm just kind of eavesdropping, just trying to get back up to speed, find out where you guys are. Okay, Ian, I don't have anything to add at this time. Okay, uh, and I know Nicholas, you said you were in a, uh, a public, loud public place, so it's fine. Uh, Nicholas is in uh, Kenya, so there you know might be a really fun place. <laughs> um, so um, let's uh, dive down a little bit. So um, um, for me, it feels like the primary requirement uh, that we have to meet is the immediate need for um, you know a one. Uh, round trip, meaning when I mean mount round trip is a one QR sent, one QR received um, uh, of a request to do something. Um, and, uh, you know, what level, I mean, you know, of support for some, you know, old legacy stuff is, you know, maybe, maybe the conversion of our format into a legacy Bitcoin, you know, the thing that they deprecated in like Bitcoin 14. <laughs> uh, um, uh, you know, could maybe be done offline and it would be canonical and, and we can do that. I don't know. Um, so far, I've not heard from Craig or Ken that we have to have, uh, you know, 100% for that. Um, but I have heard that BIP 137. So um, uh, let's see, where is BIP 37? I had it in front of me. Um, you put it in the signal chat. Ah, there it is. Uh, well, let's do just for reference here. Um, um, share screen. Bit thirty one thirty seven. Okay. So, um, you know, uh, it's been a while since I looked at this. Obviously, it's an ECDSA uh, signature. Um, uh, you know, one of the complications that you know you have to deal with with ECDSA is that. The signatures actually have the public key in it and you can extract it. But of course, there's more than one public key that you can extract from an ECDSA signature. There's four. Um, so we need to be clear on what that is. Maybe this uh, uh, does that. Um, so then they're um, you, uh, using uncompressed public keys. Obviously, we have X only keys as well. Uh, so that could cause some problems for legacy. Um, so we have to tell uh, people what that is. Um, 
you know, they've defined some, what exactly is this? So basically rather than, um, I don't know why there's 27 through 30. Uh, so they've defined, uh, you know, some hard coded um, values. Uh, uh, the question is whether or not they sign those values, but I, I, you know, I have a little bit of a concern here in the sense that um, the uh, there's no future proofing in this. Um, whereas, you know, more descriptor style output, you know, uh, details uh, can give you more things. But you know, P, uh, uh, I don't believe that um, uh, descriptors say, you know, anything about what, you know, whether or not it, it's a, sh, you know, Schnorr signature that's desired or, uh, or an ECDF, because it, it's encoded into that little, wit, that little, uh, script field, um, and script type field. Um, so I think that with, with this, you know, we don't really have too many options here. We, you know, we, we have to, generate legacy sign signatures um you know this is really just uh, a specification for how to handle the two nested segwit types for the legacy types the signature is always the, the same uh it's just for you know nested segwit and natives segwit segwit that as i was saying earlier electrum went one way fraser went another so they create slightly different signature signatures um but it's that's not really something that the that the sort of UR uh, spec needs to worry about, um, you know, that is what it is. It's, right. I think it's also useful to say that BIP 322, which is the sort of much more modern right. replacement to all of this does include support for legacy signing as well. So it's kind of uh, bringing that along for the ride. Um, but again, that doesn't really impact, you know, it just impacts whatever the hard hardware wallet needs to do. It doesn't really impact the, protocol sending stuff back and forth right so i guess so one of the things is um i'm hoping uh that we I, as i recall the original uh format of the way bitcoin core did it which is the you know the legacy that only works to with pay to script hash um what uh does not sign any of the I think it just signs a text. It does not include anything about the keys or all that other kind of stuff. Um, uh, it just simply, you know, appends as metadata this the address so that you can look up, uh, look it up, and compare the. I mean, basically, you extract the signature, you extract the public key from the signature, and then you go and you know look at the hashed uh, address and you know do they match. If they do, then it's a valid um, thing. I think we can reproduce that because it doesn't have any embedded things. And then we can include a variety of different kinds of, of meta, other metadata, which is other ways to confirm it than the address way. Um, so we could put an output there, descriptor there. We could put a, a bit 137 you know, uh, you know, tag there or whatever. Do you think that would work? Is that is that a... Uh, you know, will that you know meet the the needs that we can at least be binary compatible with the sign message, assuming they're not signing path stuff and and signing the address and things of that nature? Um, look, I think so. Um, you know, as I say, I don't think that the precise details of how the signature is created, um, so long as the signer has enough information, and I think it does. If it has those three pieces of information, we were talking about um you know it it might choose to use different methods um you know what we have in bit three 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 two two is a number of different um you know kind of we have the legacy signing we have the simple signing we have the full uh, i haven't yet implemented this myself so i don't i don't fully i don't have have a great view on on kind of all of the details here um and perhaps you know, something that we would want in future is for the requestor to be able to signal which one of these approaches it would want to use. Um, but, you know, I, I, as, as I was saying earlier, I don't think we are there today. 
I don't think BIP 322 has been implemented in any wallet that I'm aware of. Uh, it hasn't been implemented in Bitcoin Core, where I believe it's still a PR. So, you know, it's 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 not, it, it is certainly something that I think we would want space for in future, but not something that is needed today. Yeah. Well, certainly what want to feature proof for it. Um, uh, we're, you know, we tried doing BIP 322 with uh, a number of interns, like four interns got together and said, we're going to try to do BIP 322. And we actually have some Python um, uh, workbooks. What is that called? Um, uh, there's a term for it, but anyway, we have some Python work workbooks that actually implement Jupyter notebooks. It's the same type of Jupyter, right? So uh, we have some Jupyter notebooks that they did that implement three two two. But as you said, uh, um, you know, for whatever reason, it's it's not been broadly adopted. Um, maybe we can solve that problem later. <laughs> One of the main things that I want to, you know, make sure this group, uh, you know, is cognizant of is that when it comes to adopting our technologies, there's, you know, obviously a number of different approaches. And part of what we want to do is make sure that we're all using the same approach. Um, when it came to, for example, signing PB PSBTs, you know, I, uh, I faced the question of, okay, PSBT is this, uh, you know, tightly packed binary structure. It's not CBOR. Uh, it's, therefore, it's not parsable with that. But there's a lot of existing code that knows how to parse and sign. PSBTs. Um, and so is it worth expanding that to its own kind of seaboard description that might be more flexible and more future proof in certain ways? Uh, or is it worth it just kind of, you know, treating it as a black box from the level of our stack and, uh, and then just wrapping that up in, um, you know, uh, a UR or, you know, uh, as just a type, and which is the approach we took. Um, now what we're talking about is, uh, you know, uh, you know, keeping that obviously, because it's legacy, and it works, but also, uh, you know, coming up with a more kind of generic, um, you know, uh, uh, please sign this structure kind of thing. And for that, you know, crypto envelope is is an excellent choice um, because you don't even have to define it at the CBOR level. You basically define it at the semantic level. Um, and uh, but, you know, obviously, if we're talking about an existing standard uh, of of uh, signing something, then. You know, we have the option then again of, of whatever binary structure it sends of just taking that and expecting some people to parse it and do it. I it's not my preferred approach. So I want to make sure that, uh, you know, uh, with that said, uh, you know, I'd like to understand whether there's anything about the existing kind of <clears throat> binary structures here, whether it's a text file that's been sent and needs to be sent back with, you know, uh, a, a, you know, uh, a, a signed kind of header lines and things like that, or you know, things that are base 64 encoded, if that's important, or if we can basically set that aside and say, okay, for our purposes of signing things, uh, going back and forth, you know, between the signing object and, and the, the, the requester object, you know, that we can basically do this, you know, using a binary level objects using CBOR and envelope. But describing it another way, obviously, you know, we could take the front of a descriptor, which is, you know, the output, you know, the, the, the uh, the details of the of the paths in xpubs and things of that nature um uh or we can say no outside of our code you convert that into a binary structure that includes some things that it's missing like please sign this not with ecdsa sign it with schnorr or sign it with schnorr with this adapter signature you know have all these other choices but there is you know, a want a deterministic binding from, you know, the, the the current Bitcoin standards to a little binary object that allows for richer capabilities, or should we just, you know, in our libraries parse, uh, you know, these uh, uh, these forms? I mean, you know, do you have a kind of yeah. a, any thoughts on that requirement, uh, Ian? Um. I, I, I don't want to speak for Ken, but uh, I don't believe there are any binary stru structures with regard to message signing that exist today. I mean, I have read that cold card doc, but I wouldn't say that that is a widespread kind of format. And I think it's specific for just this file that you create. I, I, you know, I think it's it's useful as a reference, but I don't well, wouldn't regard it as something that needs to be followed. Um, it's not sort of br broadly used in that sense. So. I don't want to speak for Ken, but I, I suspect that you can use whatever fields you would like to create, so long as they had those three pieces of inf information in them, they should fit well within the wallets uh, that do exist today. You know, we obviously need to 
fit the message signing in with the functionality we already have for the USB ones. Uh, and those, you know, are sending those three pieces of information across. So, so long as we can fit in with that, I, I don't really um, mind at all what kind of format that information is sent in. Yeah, I would agree. Right. The, so, the cold card, the cold card file signing is kind of misleading because it can't really sign any arbitrary file. It like the file has text, to be right? a single line of text, essentially, followed by an optional second line uh, with a derivation path. And the only reason that uh, we're using it for CASA is because they were already supporting this health check with cold card using the exact same format. Um, and, there's, and I think it sounds like from that, they're actually signing the second line too, or only signing the first line and including the second line? Uh, we're only signing the first line. We, we split them out, sign the first the line. The second line is just, is just yeah. another parameter, essentially. Yeah. Yep. Great. Okay, that makes it easy. Yeah, you know, I mean, my, my hope is that we can do this in a way and say, you know, here is how something, how you take a message um you know uh take what you your other existing app to do convert it into this binary object uh and when you come back it'll exactly match what bitcoin core 14 does what bip 137 does uh you know a couple of other different variations there um such that the signature of the signed uh text but it'll it could be binary um uh will exactly match um uh, it would be yeah, al almost no work for us. It would be almost no work for us to to switch to that. Um, yeah. the, the signing is identical. It's, it already takes the three parameters, so it would just be pulling from the crypt the C yeah. format instead. You know, I, I forgot what what is you know. Obviously, when you sign a Bitcoin transaction, you're having to grab a bunch of other uh, other uh, information, um, such that you know. Uh, I mean, what prevents somebody from creating a transaction, uh, converting it and converting it and, uh, you know, trying trying to trick somebody into signing? Uh, uh, the a signatures for a PSPT are integral to the structure, not external to it. Whereas I think all, everything we're talking about here, the signature is essentially an appendage to whatever is being passed as the as the object to be signed. So when you sign a PSPT, you're actually passing back a new PSPT that's been modified with the signature. That doesn't seem to be the use case here at all. It just seems to be something where you're passing back um, a totally external appendage signature to the object that's been signed. Does that does that sound right? Yeah, I'm just trying to think if there's some, you know, a raw transaction. Um, you know, what prevents Nothing. a raw transaction, not the PSBT, but a raw transaction from from being ac you know, accidentally signed? Um, does anybody is anybody aware of how the old message format prevented that? I mean, I think that was, it only was text. So if you look at Bitcoin Core, you couldn't put binary into the command line of Bitcoin Core. Um, so you could never sign a transaction because uh, the transaction- well, Presumably if, if we pass, if, if what we receive is a arbitrary binary object and we're told how to sign it, how to drive a key to sign it and how to sign, what kind of signature to produce and we send it back, then theoretically, you know, you could, you know, assuming that the object to be signed is is not going to change at that point, the signature will be valid for it. So you might actually have that kind of exposure where somebody could pass something to be signed that, um, you know, uh, because it's essentially it's a black box. Uh, it could be uh, it could be a Bitcoin transaction. Yeah, yeah, that's what happened on Ethereum. That's what you know. Almost every major Ethereum ta uh, wallet attack in the last two years has to do with the fact that they don't do any protection there and. Mm -hmm. We, we um, and when we receive a PSPT, we do a lot of checks on it you know, to make sure that everything belongs to this wallet, uh, make sure that the amounts uh, don't look weird. Like, especially we do checks to make sure that the chain, you know, the um, the minor fee, for example, has not been manipulated to be too big. And like we warn you if it seems like it's too big, we warn, we tell you if you're doing a send to self versus, um, you know, sending to another wallet. Uh, there's a bunch of little integrity checks that we do perform. Yeah, so I understand that. But what happens if you know the request? You know the the requester QR basically says, "Please sign this um, text." But in fact, the text is a carefully manipulated binary object um, such that they can insert the you know the signature that you generate and make it a valid transaction. 
Um, um, so so the, the first thing that, you know, any um, legacy signing needs needs to do is add a, a, a piece of text onto the front, which says Bitcoin signed message with a colon. Uh, and then there's a new line after, after that. So there's no way that that could ever be okay. a transaction. So they have to put that on at the front. Um, and that's what the signer will do with the message that it gets. Um, so there's, you know, there, there's just no way that once they've signed that piece of text that that can ever be a Bitcoin transaction. Cool. So let me let me talk about that a second. So if we basically made that another binary ob um, uh, object that said, um, uh, you know, this is the prepend text or the prepend value, because you know we don't want to necessarily might in the future not always be text. Um, and we basically say in all of our notes, if you don't, if there isn't a prepended text, don't accept it. Like you have to have something different there. It cannot be null. It has to have some value, um, or else your app should sign you, your app should not sign it. Is that, you think that would work? No, no. I, what I'm saying is the, the signer would do that. The requester wouldn't even get the option of being able to, in the case of a legacy signed message, suggest what kind of prepend should be made. Um, you know, uh, at least that's not, and I'm, I'm just going to refer back, back to this, that's not the way that HWI works. And I think it's a good model, because at least it fits in well with, you know, what we're trying to achieve here. Um, is, you know, what what happens is that the signer actually adds that text and because that text is fixed and will never change, um, you know, there is no no way for the requester to ever pass something in which might be malicious because it just, it's always going to have this piece of text on the front. So our use case is actually, you know, for, you know, even considering, you know, using blockchain common stack and so on is that the message to be signed is could be arbitrarily large and therefore we need to ultimately make this compatible with, you know, URs and, uh, you know, uh, animated uh, QR codes and so on. So um, when we're receiving that message to be signed, um, you know, uh, are you saying that that message must be somehow text or must be somehow um, binary that that is is prepended with um, you know, like UTF at a UTF-8 string before being signed by the signer. So then when it's returned, it's, you know, the, 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 the requester knows that the signature is only good if you prepend that, that, that preamble. Um, look, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not actually sure whether it needs to be a, um, a UTF-8 string or not, you know, from what I can see, um, it just needs to be a byte string. I think you know that that's that's fine. So, so long as it is a series a, of bytes. Well, here here is yeah. my suggestion for this, which is that um, you know if a signer uh, receives uh, a request um, uh, without a value there, it at prepends a known uh, value, which happens to be Bitcoin or whatever you know whatever the default is. Okay. Um, if the if somebody uh, you know has some other uh, value that they say they want to be the prepend, um, that it has to be you know a, you know the signer has to go. Am I allowed to sign something that has this in the in the front of it? And if it can't, it should refuse. Otherwise, uh, you know it will it will respect that, and that allows us to do other things in the future. Have other other uh, kind. So Signing a tag that is the prepend for uh, the for for uh, BIP three two two or a non Bitcoin thing without risking uh, Bitcoin transactions. Um, right. So here, so here's an idea because we can sidestep this whole conversation if we just elevate it up to the level of using crypto envelopes. So here's a crypto envelope. It has a, a, it's a request. So it has a, it's it's subject is uh, and sorry if you know any. If, present isn't familiar with crypto envelopes too much yet, but uh, I'm going to speak in that terminology for a moment. You know, the subject of the envelope is uh, a CID, which is a random, uh, a random request ID. The body of the envelope or the assertions on it are basically the thing to be signed um, and maybe a uh, uh, an output descriptor, which, you know, could obviously the signer could only accept a subset of possible output descriptors, but basically essentially it's your path and your uh, script type and so on to, 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 know, to derive the key. And we already have support in crypto envelope uh, EC ECDSA signing. So what happens is the envelope gets wrapped, signed, uh, but, you know, the key gets derived with the contents of the request. 
uh, the payload gets wrapped, signed uh, using the same mecha mechanisms we already have uh, with an EC uh, ECDSA signature, which we support, as well as Schnorr Schnor signatures, um, and then pass back as an envelope again. And therefore, uh, you're dealing with envelopes. So no matter what happens, no matter what the payload is, since you're signing the whole envelope, um, it, you can't sign a, uh, a, a Bitcoin transaction in such a way that that signature is good for just the transaction because it signs the whole envelope. But then it wouldn't be compatible with these legacy formats, which is well. That's the thing is is is, right. is what is what is the use case? Do we need? Yeah. Are we actually replicating these legacy formats? Because if so, then that's why I asked earlier. Are we are we able to just roll our own in terms of binary formats? Because if not, let's, if we are, then let's use envelopes. If not, then we have to basically wrap up these things in. You know, we have to embed text files and sign them the same way uh, that uh, um, was it, the BIP. Uh, uh, BIP 137 says, and so on, and do it that way. Uh, so, I mean, do we have um, to have you know, binary I'll, compatibility of the signed object uh, done either way? If we do, that means we have to be more careful in and prevent these, uh, the you know, uh, a, a risky signing attack. Um, which, uh, if we do it with the, the 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 pure envelope way without any parsing. Uh, or, you know, known things of, you know, hey, don't, you know, if there's a, 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 a no prepend, we add a, we add a prepend, which is, you know, the, 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 the Bitcoin prefix. Um, uh, so the, the envelope approach can be done and make it absolutely secure, but it would not be binary compatible with a signed object from BIP 137. Um, but anybody who supports uh, with some it of those with rules, we can. So would have, yeah. So the question is, what what do we absolutely need to be compatible with, or are we just creating, you know, a new standard for signing arbitrary messages with Bitcoin, uh, you know, at, uh, with a Bitcoin with a drive Bitcoin key, uh, you know, that essentially could also be an address, but you know, uh, essentially is, you know, we're 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 talking about it in this conversation more like it's a an output descriptor or, or a subset thereof. Um, and you know, so what will suffice? And and you know, that's that's I guess the biggest question I have for the present group is: Are we trying to, um, you know, be binary compatible with BIP three twenty two and BIP one thirty seven, or are we able to actually just um, fulfill the use case of signing arbitrary messages uh, in such a way that people who pass these envelopes back and forth can can verify the signatures? By the way, Judd, uh, Wolf, BIP three two two does address that in the BIP-322 standards. So that's, uh, we, we don't have to solve it for that. The, the bad ones are the original Bitcoin signing and the uh, BIP-137 if we try to make it more flexible. Um, so um, that's the, those are the, those are the two worst spe special cases because they out of band say the return value must have this pre, you know, this uh, uh, prefix on it. Um, and uh, so that's the, the, those are the two risky ones. I don't think BIP322 is a risk. I'm, I'm, um, I'm still not following how they are a risk if they are forced to uh, prepend a, a set and fixed value. Okay. Well, um, the thing is, okay, so right now, when you send that, when you send a message to the API, um, I do not believe that 137 is prepending. It's the signer that prepends. So that means the signer needs to know I have to prepend prepend this and we're trying to make things that allow for a variety of different types of 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 such. So uh you know what you know uh we either um uh you know have some type of thing that says you know uh, you know if uh, uh, uh if we we either have some kind of specific binary thing which says this is a legacy and we're going to add you know, it could be just a single bit. We're going to add the 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 prefix, um, and uh, otherwise, you have to use one of these safer methods. Um, um, so certainly, so from my side, uh, legacy message signing, I, I wouldn't want to specify any kind of prepend ever. Um, I would <laughs> only ever want the signer to prepend the only valid uh, prepend text that that can ever be used, um, because if I was to spe specify anything else, then the signature would be invalid and all of the validators that are out there, all of the other wallets would call it invalid and correctly so. 
So I, I certainly have no desire to ever prepend anything um, when, when it comes to legacy message sign signing. And from what I can see on BIP 322, which is the future of this, um, that it falls away anyway, as you rightly point out. So, you know, for me, it's, 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 I, I, I just don't see um, that there's any need to include this uh, prepend coming from the request side. It's just not, right, not right. necessary. What I'm saying though is that that they would they they're going to say there's going to be a legacy flag, okay, uh, in the request. So it doesn't isn't going to affect the message. If you have a legacy flag, and you're asking something to be signed, what will happen? You know, the 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 API will prepend uh, the signer. Uh, on receiving the legacy request will prepend uh, this text. And there's no choice. It's like, it'll be this, this is the standard choice for that prepend. Uh, and uh, uh, and then it'll be totally compatible with all of the old uh, legacy Bitcoin and 137 and and, a, and hopefully even uh, Electrum. Um, uh, but if you put, if you don't have the legacy thing, then you have options to, uh, 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 you know, that are safe. So whether or not that's a, you know, uh, you know, some predefined things like BIP322 where you don't have to worry about it or, uh, you know, some, you know, list of various techniques to prevent these, re these, it's not really a replay attack, is it? It's not really a replay, but anyhow, uh, it's uh, uh, these malicious signings uh, that, you know, every other choice will uh, avoid the, the uh, malicious signing as well. Um, so, yeah. Christopher, may I take a moment and just kind of go through kind of these uh, quick uh, envelope examples to kind of show how it would work at this level? So, kind of um, we're all maybe, on the same page. Maybe, that, but I think the key thing is this is fine for everything else. It's the, but you can't do that. You can't use this for legacy. And, and what I heard from Craig, and I think I heard from Car uh, Ken, but maybe less so, uh, is that, you know, we have to be able to sign something that's binary compatible with these legacy things. You cannot do that with the envelope uh, signing uh, approach. That's true. That's true. So if that's it, well, if that's the case, then again, what we need to do is we need to identify which legacy signing methods we're going to support, and then create one or maybe one for each, uh, you know, a crypto request. Because ultimately, again, the use case here is um, is signing messages that are arbitrarily large, because that means that the you know the, because the by packaging them in a UR, they get sent to the signer, uh, who then performs this legacy kind of signing and just sends back the signature, which is just simple because it's always going to fit into uh, into a QR code, um, a single QR code. But sending it to the it, signer. I, by the way, I'm not seeing it being a separate crypto request. It's a um, you know a uh, you know uh, you know a, a tag that even if a signer doesn't understand it, it's a binary value that they put that they send along to our API to say that this is a, a legacy thing. Uh, but otherwise, the crypto requests look you know exactly the same. It's just some special handling is done. I mean, maybe we even double sign. We basically sign it with crypto envelope, and then in there we have the legacy extra. Uh, Sign sure. Something. I mean, that's that's easy. That's easy to do. But I, I guess what I want to know is, OK, so if we want something that's, um, you know, say compatible with uh, if we want to implement BIP 137 signing. All right. So we basically have uh, a request that says, you know, um, here's a BIP 137 compatible payload. Uh, here's the, the, you know, the path to derive, which is optional, I guess. Um, and uh, and the fingerprint. Um, and then you know we basically treat the payload as as text, as if it were just an input text file. We validate it, uh, you know, to make sure uh, on the signing side to make sure it is just one line of text, um, and uh, and then sign it and send back the signature. the The magic is in that whatever we received could be much larger than will fit in one QR code to sign, um, right. and uh, and and that's. Again, that's the whole raison d'etre of what we're what we're talking about here is that we're, we want it to fit into a UR, but we don't want it to be uh, crypto bytes. We want it to be something a little bit more, uh, you know, semantically meaningful, um, or just bytes. It's not even crypto bytes. Uh, and uh, uh, and so I'm trying to figure out what that level of semantics so, is. So is in it, other... is it just a packet that says it, it, it's just a packet that says, you know, um, uh, BIP one thirty seven sign this. Fine, that's easy to do. And so is the other one as well. Uh, they're just different. It's it's a different kind of request so, the and way so that, we're not actually using the envelope signing mechanism at all we just have a request that says sign this and a, a response that says here to, here's the signature 
Yeah. So the way the W3C does uh, this with a number of identity wallets is they have in effect a proof purpose flag. Um, and uh, it's not really, I mean, a proof purpose. Uh, I'm not saying we need to use their proof purposes, but you know, the, the first proof purpose is legacy, um, uh, which you know, technically has the bytes of, Bit, what, what'd you say the byte prefix was? It was uh, you know, Bitcoin 01 or something. <laughs> so uh, you know, so the, the signer just needs to be careful, only um, uh, support the proof purposes that you want to support, which you know, legacy, the this legacy one would be uh, you know, uh the the first one. Uh, but you know, there might be other proof purposes. Uh so like one of the problems with Ethereum was there wasn't a proof purpose difference between uh you know sign in with with uh with Ethereum and some of the other uh uh, uh other purposes. And a signer ought to be, you know, basically, oh wait a second you're asking for a different proof purpose than I want to support, or I want to, you know, do some extra confirmation. So like with sign in with Ethereum, they actually do a domain check. They're supposed to do, excuse me, a domain check to actually see whether or not the, the request came from a, a web domain. And there is an RPC connection to that web, web dom, dom, domain. I'm not saying we want to reproduce that, but that is kind of what the proof, what not having a proof purpose harmed that uh, that standard. And that's why there's a whole bunch, you know, Wayne, who's not here, uh, has been working on trying to address that. So I'm just trying to make sure that we can do the legacy, but make sure that, you know, we have an architecture that has some flexibility that can work for a variety of, you know, other, uh, other cases. And I think that, in effect, what this proof purpose is, where the proof purpose is to sign a legacy um, uh, Bitcoin message, and we we do we we do that because I don't think we can always sign with. I don't think we can all we I, having a envelope signature only as if it's not legacy. I don't think will work for a bunch of use cases. So, for instance, there are other um, other cases where a protocol might want to sign uh, a binary object. And uh, for you know uh, some offline signing purposes, or uh, you know, I mean, for various protocol purposes, or with Schnorr uh, to create an adapter signature, or other different types of things, where we can't count on them to uh, uh, to do a a UR, uh, excuse me, not UR, the the the, the triple signature that we do. Um, uh, it has to be a binary thing. So that means we have to have in our in the requests what the proof purpose is. And if you don't understand what the proof purpose is, don't do it. You know, if Ken receives some you know weird stuff and the and 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 he's asked to do a, a proof purpose that you know is you know ZK29 and you don't know what ZK29 is and you can't present in your interface what ZK29 is, say, I don't know what that proof purpose is. <laughs> I'm not signing it. Does that make sense, Ken? Yep. Okay. So uh, I'm just trying to figure out if, if, if essentially what we're after in the moment, though, is since we're talking about supporting legacy signing methods or message signing methods, is identifying a uh, a set of signing methods signing methods that we want to support, um, and identify a set of test vectors so we can make sure that we've supported them correctly, and then I can quickly, you know, design. Uh, a Seabor structure that encap encapsulates those and uh, a crypto request around them uh, and some code that actually, you know, accepts a message, uh, you know, from the set of test vectors, signs it and returns it and verifies that it matches the... I just want to not change you know, the verb. I want to say, uh, what I'm saying is that there, you know, the, uh, a crypto request to sign, um, yeah. uh, uh, you know, the, well, but if you if you're trying to say you want a, a generic signing request that supports several methods, yeah, we can do that. Um, but uh, you know, it's important to identify if, if you don't want to make it very special purpose. That it's important to kind of identify in its generality what we might support in the future, so we don't, uh, you know, right. And that's what I think. Uh, you know, so. we've got a good handle on. So the question, I guess, for you guys is. Um, when do you need this by, you know, how much, you know, back and forth do Wolf and I need to on, you know, is it a different verb or is it, you know, sign legacy or is it, you know, sign and then the object has to have some, uh, 
uh, value, uh, you know, added to it. Um, uh, I guess see, here's the thing. If, if ultimately what we have is a crypto envelope, which is a request, because we already have a format for that, there's always a verb in there because it's a remote procedure right. call essentially. And the, and the procedure and the, and the, and the verb, the, 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 the name of the call that's embedded in the envelope could be BIP 137 sign, you know, um, and the arguments passed to it could be a line of text. Right. Well, let's argue um, off about that are, offline. Are, I don't, I'm not sure I agree. You may be right. Okay. I but think that's, well, what I'm telling you is that's the architecture I've designed. That's how it works. You know, you, you, well, it's, no, but it's, you it's, could it's also a, look, you can parse you, you, re, when you receive what it is to sign, you, um, you have to evaluate, you have to evaluate that. You have to look at that, at that, uh, of the, the, you know, the, the pieces of it, um, because it might, because it may have multiple things in it. Remember, um, yes, I know, because be an optional arguments not. and so on, but th- there may right, be an that's the whole point. It, that, but that shouldn't be a different you. verb. I want uh, any anyway, we'll It's not a it. different verb, Christopher. It's not a different verb. I'm trying to tell you this. It's it's a different set of arguments to the same verb. It, the verb might be BIP 137 sign, uh, or might be what's the other what BIP we're talking about. But the point is that's the that's the basic verb. And then the nice thing about you know uh, APIs is you can add arguments later that modify the meaning of that basic verb of that basic call. Um, that, you know, uh, basically they may not exist at first, or they may be optional in the first release, um, but you can always modify it later. Uh, and you can, all, and then you add other verbs, which include, you know, ways of other, uh, uh, other ways of assigning, other legacy methods of signing. I guess that, I'm that, saying, they'll still have a payload, but they'll have other... let's take this offline. Okay. Um, okay. I'm just saying that I think, you know, there, there is a difference of opinion. Do you have more verbs or do you have more kinds of uh, information in the in the data of the request that that you do your interpretation with, and I recognize there's crossover there and whatever we can deal with that offline. <laughs> the, the question is, never... is right. Well, basically, the fundamental question as an API designer is, would you make it a separate function call? If you make a separate function call, then it's a separate verb, but it's all still part of a crypto request. It, you know, okay. uh, and if it be, it would be all be part of the same function call, then it would be the same verb. But that's that's. That's a we'll semantic decide. question. We will make can... some decisions about that later. Okay, let's not uh, let's not do that now. Um, Simon, welcome. Um, uh, Thank you. So, Craig and Ken, are you aware of what you know? Simon's uh, uh, signing um, uh, tool is, or what? You know, I'm what not. Else? I'm not. No. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I can give you a quick our... summary. Yeah. Uh, uh, basically, we're building a, a, a wearable with a secure element and uh, an NFC. It's a ring form factor that can be used to um, manage private keys, uh, act as a security key authenticator, and act as a signing device for uh, all sorts of transactions, including crypto transactions. Um, uh, so it's a um, it's it's um, special because it doesn't have much in terms of either input or output from the user, um, uh, but it does have, but it is biometrically authenticated to the user uh, while while being worn. Uh, but there is no sort of UI to show confirmation of the transaction being signed or anything like that. So it works together with a companion app that does all the uh, all the user intent uh, confirmation and then communicates to the uh, to the ring over a secure channel to to do actual signing uh, of NFC. So let me let me talk about this from the perspective of this conversation of you know one of the fundamental differences is that so if we look at the the the, the passport um, it is both a controller of private keys and it is a UX a trusted UX uh, to the user to you know that you know parses things asks various uh, uh, questions evaluates it you know, present some of that to the user to say yes or no. And then if it's true, it, it, uh, the, the, the passport will sign it. Whereas there's a more explicit separation, uh, in the, in the proxy architecture where the trusted UX is on a trusted app and the keys are on the, you know, on a, uh, uh, on a, uh, um, you know, on a on a on a wearable. So um, so one of the complications that this adds in this story, and this is why you know Wolf and I are maybe tussling a little bit on this uh, verb versus object type thing, is that what'll happen is is that um, the uh, 
you know, a, re a request like to sign is received by uh, the wallet, by the, the, the iOS app, excuse me, or the mobile app. Um, and, you know, it's going to do some prelim preliminary requesting and things of that nature. Uh, but ultimately, probably what it does in most cases is it basically uh, now is going to make a new QR request, but maybe with the same identifier to the ring where it's doing the hashing for it uh, because the ring can't hash, can't do a BIP322, has no network access, et cetera. And the ring now is receiving a signing request to sign this hash. Which then is going back out to the to the uh, to the to the iOS device, who is then packaging it for the final response back to the requester. So um, that's kind of um, you know uh, uh, you know a use case where that particular functionality is now being split between two trusted devices. Um, so I want something that'll work for Simon as well as doing the very basic use case of you know okay you know I'm gonna make this specially formatted thing. I don't even want, I don't want to understand URs. I don't understand, want to understand uh, uh, any of this, this other stuff. I just want to have this message signed uh, in a BIP 137 uh, thing. And we basically say, put this at the front of it, uh, you know, change this byte to, uh, to make it for the length, pass it on as in the, in, in a Q, in a UR form and, you know, somebody else will convert it to a QR code or send it over an NFC or whatever, but it, to make it dirt simple, uh, when in fact that thing that they're putting in the front of that, um, message is, uh, is, uh, you know, uh, rich in the future to be able to handle a variety of different things and ultimately allows, you know, Simon's ring to sign it because it can only sign the hash. It can't sign the whole message. Um, it can't hash it yourself. Go ahead. Somebody raised their hand, I thought. S Simon, do you did, is that a fair representation? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, some of the uh, you know some of the other things that I would like to see is I would like this to be uh, fairly, um, uh, let's say, uh, chain agnostic or even crypto system agnostic so you can have different types of signatures different types of keys whether it's um say like p256k1 or r1 or um uh, eddsa um uh since since you're not going to have a specific a specific hardware device for each different type of thing that you're using i would even say that the message again nobody needs to understand the who doesn't want to handle it? I mean, it should say what the derivation format is from the fingerprint of the master key. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly, so exactly. If there's a specific the, one that's required, then yes. Yeah, the, the ring can parse the border, right? So John, it's, 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 I'm sorry. Well, sorry. Go ahead. I'm just I was saying, say, uh, Simon, the, the 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 Java card on it's a Java card on the on the ring, right? The Java yeah. card compatible. So um, it can it can parse Cbor, right? So you, you know if you pass it a Cbor, you know something encoded as Cbor, it can basically parse the fields of it out, see what for example what's the payload. What's to the a limited payload. extent, it can't run a full fledged Cbor parser, uh, but it can. But Cbor is simple enough to to parse in a dumb way or right. naive way where so you wouldn't want to use something as sophisticated as the envelope layer for that then you'd want to have a request response which is pure seabor uh which is you know you essentially could just prepend as a uh uh you know as a binary uh and you know have kind of very limited uh, obviously being seabor it could have fields added to it later but you probably would yeah use the envelope, yeah the yeah and layer of the stack in that case yeah you uh and and it can have it can have you know, it, it, I'd be able to do basic CBO parsing of, you know, there's several header fields that need to be passed out to identify like what type of key it is or key, key fingerprint or whatever. Um, it's uh, basically, I would say a subset of CBO that more or less resembles um, TLV, right? Uh, so most of the uh, tag length value. Um, okay. Right. Uh, most of uh, most of uh, Java card APIs operate on TLV type structures, um, so uh, there is structured data, and and you know Cibo has um, sort of a subset of that. And I've I've decoded and coded things like SSKR shares from from Cibo before, so it's not j just something that's not 
deeply nested or requires like a generic, a fully generic C repository. So you're just hard coding it for specific use cases, I guess? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. My take on it is that, you know, his ring wants a crypto request um, to sign. And, uh, but then along with it, it is basically getting, um, you know, here is a fingerprint. And so it goes, I don't have that key and, and says no. Or the next thing it says it has is a, uh, a kind of derivation from that, uh, think from that master key fingerprint. And it can go, I don't know how to do that, ver that uh, path. But if you, if you, if, you know, Here's a, a uh, what I call a partial error. If you'll transform it for me, if you'll do the derivation, I might still be able to do it. And then uh, the next thing would be the path if it does understand what the derivation is. And then there's the 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 uh, the hash because I don't think that it can. I mean, what there are some limits to how much you can do the hashing um, and the hash of the thing to be signed. Um, uh, so I can I can I can hash pretty much anything. I just uh, I don't have the code space to be able to interpret what I'm hashing. So I can't make a I might I can't make a judgment of whether this is a valid transaction structure because I'm not going to have knowledge of all the possible different transaction structures and not have the code space to to implement those. Um, but I can certainly generate a hash of a message uh, in most sort of most common. Hashing well, let me, let me, but let me you need, you need the image to hash cool. in that case, and that means that the whole image has to be transferred to the ring. And so you'd probably rather sign a hash rather than right. have to. Yeah, use, yeah. Uh, uh, the uh, yeah, the image. phone are paired. So, I mean, it can't, you know, <laughs> unlike the passport, who cannot trust that the QR it received is uh, fair. Uh, the, the, you know, in fact, it's almost like, you know, in the passport, you have a, an SE and an MCU. It's like now the MC and the, uh, uh, the MCU and the SE are in two different places, but they do trust each other. There is a pairing that is happening there. So in, I think, am I incorrect that you, you can assume that, you know, if the, the, uh, uh, if you receive something from the iOS app, might as well let it do the hashing. Um, yeah. because it's got to do it anyhow to do the, the user presentation. Um, yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, most of the time there's no reason for the device to do the hashing because it's the, the app can do the hashing. There's, uh, there's one ex exception, which is um, uh, EG25519, where the original message is required to generate the signature. You can't just sign the hash. Um, but that's, that's, that's the internals of how EDDSA works. Um, so... Um you know, back to the, you know, trying to, trying to take in the big picture, I'd like to have for you, Craig, and you can, uh, an initial thing that, uh, you know, is, uh, you know, a basic demo that we can do these single round trip um, uh, solutions for your two legacy needs, um, but, uh, but is, you know, flexible enough to serve proxy, because I mean, there, there are, so to give you some context also with some of our other discussions, um, the, uh, you know, we're working with Crossbar on New Silicon, and we've been talking with Tropic Square and others, where the SE may finally be able to actually sign uh, with Bitcoin keys, uh, and be able to sign with Schnorr in the secure element, but they're very constrained devices, and they've kind of said, we want to kind of do, a, you know, a, a, a Seabor uh, envelope type thing, even for, you know, down at that very low silicon level. So, you know, we need to be able to handle use cases that are these very uh, constrained devices where it's okay if, you know, let's say uh, somehow the ring and the uh, uh, is uh, a little uh, spec out of sync with the iOS device, the ring ought to be able to say, no, I can't do that. Um, but I can give you uh you know, a continuation, uh, and you come back to me uh, after doing some things that I can't do. Um, so the same thing is, you know, they're talking about in these silicon devices where, like with frost type things, where some of the operations are very computationally expensive, um, you know, the, the secure element can say, well, I'm still going to hold on to the keys. I'm not going to give you the keys like, you know, Trezor does. Uh, uh, but if you will do these transformations for me, so it ends up being this kind of you know, crypto request to do this, parsing crypto request to do this, returns back with a partial failure, something happens here, comes back, it's finally signed. 
brought back and then back out to the users. So uh, that is the, 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 the thing we want to try to, to enable uh, without stopping Craig and Ken or allowing other people to do, uh, you know, we need to do it you know, fast enough so that Craig and Ken can get their legacy thing out there to serve the immediate need of CASA and to try to, you know, uh, have less that kind of, things. go ahead. You know, for that kind of back and forth, repeated back and forth, you know, envelope, you know, using our request response structure is ideal. I'm just concerned that, uh, that, uh, this, that um, uh, Simon's uh, uh, Java card element is probably not powerful enough to to parse and write that format very well. It can do basic Seabor uh, in a constrained way, but trying to do something as general as envelope might just be, you know, would probably be over the line. Well, yeah, and I don't think he has to do as general as envelope. He just needs to be well, able to, to have some well known requests. Uh, yeah, ex exactly. But that seems to me that's a separate protocol from a higher level envelope based protocol that that people using, you know, um, uh, uh, mobile devices and desktop devices and so on would would generally prefer uh, at that level where you're talking about such a small embedded device, you need almost a different protocol. Now it can all be, you know, it's ultimately all, all Seabor, but the right. question is, are you using a higher level semantic structure like envelope to package these things, uh, which would probably overload, you know, uh, a very small embedded element like that. Um, and then uh, you design a specific subset for that very small embedded and for that constrained environment because it's, it wouldn't be preferred to use that higher levels. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it might be necessary to use it at the lower levels. Yeah, and it might be it's you know in in, in this in this particular case because you have a uh, a body in the middle that's able to reinterpret that request, it can extract the bits out of it that it needs to pass down to the lower level and. Right. Repackage them in, in repackage them in something simpler. Even if it even if it just repackages them in 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 TLV rather than Seabor for that purpose, that's um uh, that's uh, that's fine as well. It's it's more about having, um, uh, I guess standardized semantics at the original request level so that you know what to expect, right? right. Um, uh, in terms of which which fields are going to be there, how are the keys going to be referenced? Uh, and what the what the expected result is. Um, the actual format packaging can be uh, can be translated right. for the for the device. So we'll yeah, figure so that out. It? So right. the, so you know, uh, 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 proxy is a full sustaining um, uh, supporter of blockchain commons, and we meet with them rec regularly. Um, so you know, we'll we we don't necessarily have to solve all those problems right now. I think the main thing I wanted to communicate to Craig and to Ken is that, you know, uh, part of what we're trying to be careful about is to make sure we conserve, you know, lots of wallet developers and, and Simon has some very specific needs, uh, but we also recognize your needs. I mean, you know, Ken has also been a, an ongoing sponsor of, of uh, uh, blockchain commons uh, as well. And, uh, uh, you know, I want to meet his needs uh, in, in uh, also. And I think we have enough knowledge that, you know, uh, uh, Wolf and I can knock around something that uh, will solve the legacy need and yet, you know, be able to have the right, you know, uh, choices to solve uh, Simon's needs and some of these oddball mm -hmm. weird things like, you know, so the Jade Wall, I'm try I've been trying to get Blockstream to join Blockchain Commons and uh, maybe if we can, we'll finally get Cold Card and some of these other people to participate here because I haven't been able to get them to come. I've tried and tried. Um, the uh, uh, is that, you know, uh, Jade Wallet does this extra thing. They have an extra optional field, which is this nonce like random thing and when the when the when the signature is all done they're not just providing the the signature they're also providing that the signature was done properly given the knot the, the weird nonce that was it was given in the initial request those are both optionals it's like you know if if um you know, Craig, you see this optional thing and you don't want to, you know, deal with exfiltration uh uh stuff, you just ignore that field. Um, if you receive, if your uh, software signer receives this nonce, uh, you know, you don't have, you know, you, it's optional. Um, 
So, because it's really ultimately the verifier who cares whether or not it was ultimately uh, done, not you, you as a signer can say, no, I don't know how to handle this uh, exfiltration nonce, uh, but I can still deliver you a software-based uh, 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 signature as you've requested. So those are the kinds of things uh, and, and, and uh, adapter signatures and some of these other weird things that we want to make sure we're able to do. Uh, does that does that help your confidence in uh, Craig and Ken? Uh, yeah, no, that's that sounds good. Uh, the, the other thing I wanted just to add is uh, I've been working um, the last few weeks on uh, a different BIP, BIP one two nine, which is the uh, Bitcoin multisig um, sharing protocol, uh, and that also uses legacy. Well, it, it uses BIP three two two, but which includes legacy message signing and all of the examples are using legacy message signing there so you know the immediate roadblock that i ran into which again brought me here was that uh, that immediately excludes all of the qr code uh, hardware wallets because of course they are then unable to sign those messages being without that um so that is a multi-line format uh, i believe all legacy message signing i've just been doing a bit of research is utf8 just so that you know, but that that just might uh, also help uh, you, Wolf, just as you look mm -hmm. through at the different sort of examples there. It's not just a single line of text. At times, it is a multi-line line, line, line of text. And that uh, that can actually, uh, it, it doesn't seem to be commonly expected. For instance, the cold card doesn't allow you to sign a multi-line of text. It actually throws an error. So it's just something to be aware of. I mean, there's some similar mm -hmm. things. I know with the uh, with crypto request in PSBTs, if you remember, there's uh, uh, what we call you know the unsigned notes or uns I, I forgot what the exact field is, um, but we have the Cbor thing you can add so that you can add a comment that is not you know part of the signature that is an untrusted note to give you some information. Uh, so you know, we want to be able to handle those kinds of optionalities, and maybe that's where that second line goes or other kinds of, of things. And then, of course, if the signer and the, and the requester have a trusted relationship, they can even sign those notes so that you actually know that the, the uh, say, the, the, the no private key, Mari, I'm sorry, the no, sorry. Uh, uh, the the no private key coordinator can still have a trusted relationship with the the signers um, and you know use these uh, uh, these public keys to trust the signers and we can you know make it such that that kind of relationship will not break anybody so um, uh, so uh, Ken how about you how do how does that in, um, sound. Yeah, that'll sound great. I mean, our, our needs are pretty limited right now. Um, as we get into our next device, uh, I think we're going to be looking at a lot of other potential use cases, though. Okay. Um, I can, I'm can i planning to like uh, reach out to you at some point in the next few weeks about some of those. Great. Um, Simon, am I missing anything? No, I think that's, um, I think that's about right. So my takeaway from this in my action item personally, is I'm going to be studying the um, the uh, BIP-137 and BIP-322. Um, I want to design some, um, at this point, you know, uh, envelope-based structures that, you know, use our uh, request response format, um, and then probably come back to you guys and show some actual running code, which, you know, basically shows, okay, here's how you would compose a message using the envelopes, you know, in, in, probably in Swift code, because that's what I, that's where uh, our current implementation is, although we're starting to work on our Rust stack now. Um, and um, uh, and then, you know, here's how you compose it. Here's how you, you here's how the receiver was receive it, uh, validate it, sign it, send it back. And here's how the re the, the requester of the, of the signature could then uh, easily extract the data and reformat it in such a way so that it would be essentially the result of say, you know, uh, a cold card signing, you know, uh, a single line of text or whatever, you know, even if it didn't come back that way, it'd be, it'd be trivial essentially to extract these fields, put them into that format and have something that would work with legacy devices. Does, does that sound right to everybody? Yeah. Yep. 
uh, and BIP 322 sounds a lot more complex, but I will also research that and see at least if I can't get some, uh, you know, functional subset of that working as well. Um, and then, you know, so basically, you know, there's, it's obvious what the path forward would be if we all want to support this um and and you know have it make sense to all of us in, in terms of how that would work obviously when it comes to something like the ring um you know it would be probably another layer where the envelope is extracted by the ios device um packaged up into a much smaller seaboard structure uh that's much more kind of you know because it's smaller and, uh, and tighter it's also a bit more brittle but it's very sp uh, uh purpose specific that would be sent to the ring signed sent back um that kind of thing does that sound right simon Uh, yep. Great. No, I'll I'll, sh I'll share with you in this, in a sec what uh, just what that uh, what it looks like uh, currently for uh, uh, what we are. If you're in the signal channel, that'd be great. If you would, if you're going to send a URL or whatever, you send it in the signal channel. That yeah, yeah. You persist past yeah, this just, conversation. Yeah. You know, also, just, you know, some things, I mean, one of the things we have to appreciate is we want to be able to support the simple things simply and the complex things mm -hmm. as elegantly as we can. And, you know, like with BIP 322, I don't think we're ever going to have a BIP 322 that can be done on um, on a ring because, uh, mm -hmm. well, excuse me, there are sub cases of BIP 322 that can be done on a ring. But anything that's pay to script hash or taproot or whatever, you know, you have to have a, a a a Bitcoin script parser. You have to have you know access to 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 Bitcoin data in many cases, uh, et cetera. And you know, clearly, uh, that's not something that Foundation Devices core passport device uh, will be able to do because there's no network. Um, and you know, maybe they can do some of the Bitcoin uh, stuff. Um, so we want to have, you know, these kind of graceful partial failures where, you know, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a device like the, the physical passport, I know that you guys are working on iOS apps and stuff. So you may ultimately have a trusted relationship, uh, between your device, like Simon has between his two. Um, but you know, where your, your passport can basically go, well, I can't sign that, but if you'll, you know, if you'll do this operation for me, uh, you know, I'll sign it. Um, so yes, that makes it two round trips because you're doing QR code, QR code, QR code, QR code, but it works. Um, so, uh, we want, you know, we want to be able to, to future proof for those types of, uh, scenarios. So, you know, just to speak to that briefly, um, QR will not always be our only communication method. Cool. Well, yeah, we want to support right. NFCs. I mean, I, most people don't know this, but the reference wallet, which again is not a commercial, it's not something we're trying to go out and sell uh, and make a, a business out of, but it's just a reference for all this, supports NFC URs now. Um, so that's like one of my other reasons. Well, I was gonna, just want to say one of the other reasons why I want to drag in the cold card people, because they're the only, that, that tap signer is is very proprietary and and it'll some of the code is not open and i really want to be able to do that you know with uh you know what tap signer does but with uh you know an open standard and you know open completely open source the java card stuff in the tap signers as far as i know is not available to the public to for review yeah, but the, the way we've designed our stack is obviously if you want URs because you're especially because you're doing QR codes, it's there, you know, that's that's your kit, but below that is Seabor, uh, you know, and and kind of, you know, outside of that is envelope so you can have envelope that's encoded to Seabor that's turned into a UR, you know, and then you you reverse that process but you don't, you know, if you're just dealing strictly between, you know, uh, uh, an iOS device and an embedded device like the like the the ring. You don't need URs. You don't need to parse URs. You don't need to send text. You just send this to the raw binary seed. So, yeah. yeah. So, or base 64 it if that's what you desperately well, have to do, you know? <laughs> it, yeah, whatever. Uh, you know, but the point is that our stack is, it has a very clean separation of responsibilities. So you only pick the parts of it that you really need. Okay. Well, um, does anybody have any objections to me sharing this uh, video to the broader community? No. No. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to um, go ahead and stop recording now. And thank you very, very much. Uh, I think our next step is to give you, uh, you know, uh, a uh, 
preliminary, this is how you can do legacy that we think addresses, you know, the future use cases without explaining them all to you. <laughs> and um, uh, try to get that to you relatively quickly so that you can, you know, make sure it solves your things. And then we can run the, the, the bigger details of, you know, how some of these other use cases buy not only other uh, wallet companies, but also I want to run it by some cryptographers to make sure we don't have any protocol, you know, snafus like the Ethereum people have had. Um, so I'm hoping Wayne can review it and, uh, and maybe, uh, um, you know, some other people are more sensitive about these uh, issues. Um, so thank you very much for your time and uh, we'll get back with you shortly. Um, we also next uh, on the first have a, uh, uh, which is, uh, you know, a week from now uh, on, we have a more general call uh, in the afternoon. So I know Craig, you can't make it um, about DCBOR and the DCBOR library. Um, we have it in uh, uh, Swift and uh, uh, Rust uh, right now. And we're working on getting it into Kotlin and into Python. Um, and we wanted to talk with you all about that because it's a found it's underneath the envelope library and it's generally useful. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we'd love to have more people uh, using it and then we can give a, a report out on on other things. So, again, the first will uh, be our next meeting. And I uh, I don't remember, is it three thirty or four on uh, next Wednesday? Uh, but anyhow, I'll send uh, I have uh, four. I have four p.m. Pacific time 4 on uh... Pacific. And then Craig, if you're interested in these types of things uh, as well, um, you know, we can, you know, maybe alternate. We have some problems because we, we also have some uh, Vietnam uh, based developers who are actively, uh, you know, using, uh, you know, uh, SSKR and, and some of the other UR standards. So we've been scheduling friendly for them, uh, but we can also alternate. Um, uh, Simon, do you want to quickly say something about? Are you are you thinking we'll be up to talking about SSKR um, first? Simon, you're on mute. Uh, yeah, yes, yeah, sir. Um, uh, sir, what specifically you? Oh, I just wondered if you might be able to talk about SSKR um, uh, on the first. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Probably. I don't see why not. Okay, so anyhow, I hope you guys will join us for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much and uh, uh, talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.